Circuit lecture on tonight, which is at 7.15. So we'll be trying to finish at 7. Um, so there probably won't be time for questions. Um, and I'll have to be sort of clearing some of the front row here for the people who are supposed to be coming for the Merkit lecture. So those of you who are sitting on, I'm in, in the front rows, I may have to shift you. Okay. Well, thanks for coming to the last evening lecture in our technical series. It's been, it's been a really, really good success, actually. We've had good turnout to the people and the format seems to have worked. But if anyone has any comments on who you would have liked to have heard or on what you did hear, if, if you drop a note to me or talk to me about it, then we can think about it for next year or for any lectures for the, f you know, the rest of the year. So tonight we have Bill Watts from Max Fordham's and Julian Ferry from uh, Ferry and Heron Architects. They're going to be focusing their talk around the topic of, of art galleries. Um, Bill's going to uh, be looking into the sort of you know, do they have high levels of servicing and why is this so? Um, looking at the energy of it and alternative energy strategies. Um, Julian is a bit more of a general investigation about art and space and focusing on light and issues like this. The two of them have worked together and are working together at the moment on um, the South London Gallery and there have been projects in the past between the two practices, if not between the two people speaking today. Um, but like a lot of projects, some of them sit in abeyance and some of them roar on. So tonight we'll, I'll hand it over to Bill to start. And thanks for coming. Right. Um, what I'd like to do is run through the sort of basic engineering aspects of uh, art galleries that um, we have to deal with uh, as, as building services engineers. If you don't know that we are building services, Max Holden Partners are building services engineers. Um, within an art gallery, you've always got conflicting requirements. Um, on the one hand, you've got to show the art within your collection to the best effect, which means lighting it well, lighting it brightly, um, using natural light. Um, what's that rattle? Is that anything I'm doing? Yes. <laughs> The other thing is good public access, because generally speaking, their art galleries cost a lot of money. And they've got to be justified by um, large throughputs of people that they can show their um, political masters that um, you know, they're justifying their existence and their, their, and their subsidies. Now, that's on the one hand. On the other hand, um, art in our society tends to be valued very highly for one um, reason or another, so, um, and they tend to be, the objects themselves can be more expensive than the building that they are housed in. Um, so it's got to be, so the conservatives come into the, their own in, in stopping the, the art deteriorating due to um, light, which I'll come on to in a minute, changes of humidity, pollution, pests, pestilence, um, insects, um, rot, and all sorts of other things like that, um, which tends to m suggest that you shouldn't show the art at all. You should put it away in a sealed box and uh, don't let anybody look at it. The other thing is, um, which is a more human um, problem associated with art, is uh, the problem of vandalism and theft um, being such conspicuous things. An object of art is quite fun to, to vandalize it. Um, ensures good publicity of yourself, and also if you steal it, it um, it's uh, something you could sell, particularly if you've got some unscrupulous buyer. So let's take these issues one at a time. Um, the first issue is lighting. Um, this is arguably the most important aspect of a gallery. It, from an, um, an exhi exhibitor's point of view, um, an exhibition designer's point of view, it is the most important and probably from the public's point of view it is as well. Now from a conservation side, I touched on it before, all pigments um, in dyes and paints absorb light and to a greater or lesser, lesser extent are degraded by that light. So ideally um, one should again keep the art in a, in a sealed box so it doesn't get uh, um, 
exposed to any, any light. Now, this isn't very convenient in terms of people seeing it. So there are um, various, the, the strategies that uh, um, are adopted in art galleries is that um, you make sure that whatever light is falling on the, um, um, whatever energy is falling on the art, it is visible energy. At either end of the visible spectrum, there is ultraviolet and infrared, which you can't see, but still can damage the art. It, the, the pigments will still absorb that um, energy and get heated up a bit and get, um, which will cause the, the, the pigments to degrade a bit. So you must make sure that the energy that's going onto the, uh, the object is within the visible spectrum. Um, so you're not wasting uh, the energy that you're, you, that in terms of um, uh, light you can't see, energy you can't see. The other is to limit the intensity of the illumination or the duration of exposure. The current wisdom at the moment is to limit um, very sensitive things like um, uh, watercolors to 50 lux. I don't know if you know what 50 lux looks like, but it's not much. It's about what it is in that corner over there. Anybody can see it. Within this room, it's about two, two to three hundred lux. Um, well, in just under there, it'll be more like 500 lux. So that's for fragile fabrics and watercolors and things. That, that you shouldn't have more than 50 lux. For oils and more robust things, you can go up to 200 lux. So that's, from a con conservation point of view, a limitation put on the amount of lighting put on um, um, objects. Now, to display things properly, um, one is trying to reproduce the, uh, the manner in which the artist was the light that the artist had in mind or when he was painting it or sculpting it or creating it. So color is very important. Now, pigments, as I said, pigments absorb um, colors from light and the colors that they don't absorb but re-radiate is the color of that pigment. Um, this scarf, uh, that red is absorbing all the blue, the green, and the other colors, and re-radiating the red. Now, that supposes that there is some red light coming onto it. If there isn't any red light coming onto it, it will appear black. Now, this is my first slide, which I haven't tried. <laughs> now, now this is... One of these experiments, it probably won't work. So you've got to bear with me. That's a, that's some yellow light. Now, this is a kind of Perrier. You, you can see that the, uh, the the difference in color. Can you determine what color that is? something else. But um, you get the general idea. If that was a blue, if that was a, uh, a yellower light, you wouldn't be able to see anything apart from yellow. But unfortunately, it isn't pure yellow, so that didn't work as well as I'd hoped. But uh, that was um, just to illustrate one of the points. Right. Okay. <laughs> color. Now we've come on to, um, uh, we'll come back to color when we uh, discuss light sources. But the other important aspect of how you light something is the direction, the directionality of the, the light falling onto things. Now, how do I get this into that? Uh, woo. Didn't want it quite that. Right. Now, this 
is a, uh, um, a photograph taken from a postage stamp photograph within a, a lighting catalogue. And it illustrates what I'm talking about. There, this is somebody trying to sell some down lighters. But it's a quite a good illustration of the, the bus there, you can see, is less, is shown up in less sharp relief there than that one. The shadows are far more intense. Um, the reason for that is that that you've still got one light source there, and I imagine the colour of the ceiling is the same. But the colour of the walls, that is more reflective than that. So consequently, most very little light is being reflected up from the different sides. Um, within this particular box, and more is being reflected around in here. If you, if you could imagine that all these walls were white and the floor was white, there'd be very, even if with a one point source there, you would get very little shadow there. Um, <coughs> so, but this is the, uh, the ratio between the direct, direct illumination and indirect illumination or diffuse if you have a completely diffuse field of light, you will, won't get any texture of what you're looking at. And you, if you have a light beaming light floor, light walls, it's a bit like being in a cloud, a complete sensory deprivation. You, you haven't got any feel for, for texture at all. Um, and whereas something like this, it's also pretty oppressive too. If you had matte black walls with just thin lights coming down, everybody will be walking around in very sharp shadow. Very dramatic and very good for showing off relief, but um, very unforgiving for brush strokes and things like that, or maybe you want to show that up. So that's um, direct or diffuse light. Now, the arguments about color and direct and diffuse light, uh, also it doesn't really matter if one's talking about whatever light source daylight or artificial light. So I'm going to come on to the, the source of light now. Um, daylight, I've called it the holy grail of art galleries, that um, it is something which is held in great esteem, it's rev revered, um, and it's thought to be the one thing that makes or breaks an art gallery. And I'd just like to look at this um, a bit more critically than uh, than treating it as, a, as an unassailable commodity. Let's have a look at it. It's free um, in that you don't have to pay for electricity to, to, um, to provide it, except for the heat loss that you get through the, through the glass. It's highly variable in its intensity. Um, in sunlight, you will get up to 150,000 lux. Um, in a very lightly overcast sky, you'll get 70,000 lux. Um, this compares with the 200 lux that one's looking for within an art gallery. Um, you can see you've got, you can't let very much of that light through. Now, the 150,000 and 70,000 on a very bright day, a standard overcast sky um, is more like five to 10,000 lux. So you've got this huge range of, um, of daylighting, of, of, of intensity. And if you're trying to conserve a standard low level of light, that is, that's a, quite a tall order. Basically, you've got a 30 to 1 ratio of, of light between the 5,000 lux and the 150,000 lux, uh, which you've got to work to, to, to maintain a standard of light. Now... Oops. This is rather an old, it's an old picture and an old drawing, but I mean, it shows you the, com the complexity of trying to achieve this constant light level. This is a, a, a um, it was a new extension of the National Gallery. It is no longer the newest one. It's quite an old one now. But you can see you've got glazed roof lights here. Um, I'm not sure if that's glazed or not, but you've got motorized blinds all the way across there, plus louvers there, a walkway here, service access, and artificial light there. And this is the effect. Well, it's, it's very good. It's nice diffuse light coming down. Um, and it lights.
match the walls nicely. But the I would say I, I wouldn't know whether or not that was daylight or not. Um, because, well, we'll come on to the color rendering in a moment. The only thing that sets that ap apart is the fact that it's, if this is nicely controlled all the time, so you will get a constant level of illumination there. One's talking about the only difference between that and artificial light is what color it is. Um, now, the other thing about natural light is it isn't a, con a constant color. It does change depending on the cloud conditions, the position of the sun in the sky. I mean, in the early morning, in the evening, it does go redder. Um, if you've got clear blue sky with direct sunlight, the clear blue sky is bluer than, um, than an overcast sky, such as we've had a leaden sky that we've had today. Um, so it, it isn't a, a constant commodity. Now, I maintain, well, we'll come on to um, the, the difference between them, w which is better in a minute. Let's go through the, what the options are on the artificial side. Um, obviously, at night, you do need artificial light. Um, now, let's have a look at the color spectrums here. This is the spectrum of the visible spectrum of daylight. And it's a sort of um, quite an even illumination. Incidentally, if you plotted the invisible part, it would go off. This is red, so it goes into infrared, so it would go off, taper off like that. And um, equally, the ultraviolet, if you go over here, you do get some it carrying off down that end as well, but not much. It's quite up quite sharply there. And the, um, the CO2 and water vapor cuts off the infrared bit of as well. Now, so this is the sort of st the standard that we're comparing uh, our, our light sources to. This is an incandescent light. By incandescent, um, what that is, is um, the way in which it produces its light is to heat something up, which is effectively, a, it, does, it doesn't matter what it is. If you heat something up hot enough, it will glow. The sun is heated up to 6,000 degrees centigrade, and it glows um, quite white, and it produces a, a spectrum like, very s like this, but this is filtered out quite a bit by the atmosphere. An incandescent bulb um, only goes up to 3,000, whoops, and its spectrum is shifted across to the infrared side. So most of the light it produces is in the invisible band, in the infrared. Um, and you've got the tail here uh, of visible light, which is why incandescent lights aren't very efficient, because most of the energy they produce is in the infrared side, uh, which is invisible, so you get more heat than light. Um, so let's look at some other options here. No, not that one. Not that one. Now, discharge lighting. Um, this is a sodium, this is sodium light, which is what you've got out there at the moment is high pressure sodium, which is a bit better than this. This is really cheapo street lighting. Now what it is, is you pass an electric current through some atoms and it's, you strip off the electrons. Um, and when they come back to their normal state, they give off a certain amount of light, which is called discharge lighting. Now, sodium lighting, um, uses one particular metal, that's sodium, and it fluoresces at a particular frequency. Well, this isn't very good for seeing anything, art, because everything appears yellow. And it is um, what I was trying to reproduce with the first slide, but it uh, didn't work very well. Um, but if, you've, if you have a look at, um, I noticed this to my cost, actually, uh, street lights, you know those yellow boxes you get in the middle of um, um, junctions? Have you come across?
across those. Well, in the city, there's an area which has got lots of yellow boxes and white lines and traffic lights. And I thought that I was driving straight across a yellow box. In fact, I was driving across a yellow or white line which had a red light associated with it. But because of the yellow sodium lights, I didn't see the fact that it was a white line that I should have stopped at. And I was then booked for going through a red light. And I was ready... I was preparing myself for these arguments in court, <laughs> but they only got me for a, an unreadable license plate, which is a bit more difficult to <laughs> contest. So that's a, that's, that's a rather poor discharge light. Now, by shuffling around the different fluorescent materials that you use, let's see if I can get this right. you can get a much better profile. Now, I know that doesn't look very much like that, but actually, if you saw a fluorescent lamp like that, you'd be hard-pressed to tell it from actual daylight. I mean, and there are better ones than that. You can see where I'm going. I'm saying, well, you know, artificial light can be made pretty similar to daylight. The only difference is you have to pay for it. Now, um, I think that uh, I can now, we, we, we can now have a look at what the comparison between artificial and um, natural light is. My own personal view is that um, to control natural light too much in the way in which we saw in the natural gallery is to, is, is to sort of neuter it um, to the point that, you know, it, it becomes a bland um, bit of... Uh, servicing. It's another bit of managed um, material, which you might as well have done it with, with artificial light. So, but to, to enjoy it, um, I think you want to let it rip, um, it, use it on exhibits that don't really mind being too light, don't really mind changing in um, color and things like that, and so you can enjoy the fact that the light does change. So, and I think I have got a picture of. Yes, this is the Saatchi Gallery, um, where they have certainly haven't got any solar control whatsoever. It, it's got a huge daylight factor up here. Uh, there we are. There we are. Um, this is an old laundry, I think, or bus shed, something like that. Anyway, you can see the the. the the sawtooth configuration, all of that is completely glazed, and then that's solid, glazed, solid, glazed, solid. And um, it gives you a, a huge amount of light in there, but obviously um, Mr. Sarchi doesn't really mind. It's all his stuff. He doesn't really mind, well, you know, if he get, fades a bit, and it's uh, he's lost a few. <laughs> doesn't really mind too much. Plus, I would have thought that something like that doesn't mind being too light. It's well preserved. Um, so uh, that's, so uh, let's leave um, lighting now and I know Julian's going to come back to it because that's interesting architecturally. Now um, climate control is the, uh, is the next big thing that is less, it is not a something that's perceived by the public but it's certainly something that the conservators are, are worried about. Um, now, this is some um, um, the sort of hard sums that we building services engineers do. Um, I'll just go through why people are worried about um, uh, humidity and temperature. It, humidity uh, with a, a hair hydrograph is measured by the the length of that hair changing in accordance with the amount of humidity in the air. So things change shape when, the, uh, when they change the amount of water within them. Now, just as a hair hygrometer changes shape, um, so does a piece of art, um, a chair, a piece of wood, something like that. Now, if you've got, it doesn't really matter if it changes shape in a, in a homogeneous manner and um, and slowly, 
the fact that it is changing shape doesn't really matter. But if you've got a composite structure such as a chair or, um, or a, a, some canvas with some uh, paint on the front of it, those, the different elements will expand and contract at different rates. <coughs> um, so the object, the, the, the conservators, um, uh, ob uh, what, what they're looking for is stability of conditions. Now, um, that means uh, they want the air that, the, um, that the, the exhibits are in to be at a constant uh, temperature and humidity uh, so that you don't, they're not subjected to these changes. Now, this is a, what's called a psychometric chart. Uh, there we are. That's the CIBSE. Um, now, what, for those, I'll just run quickly through what it all means. You've got dry bulb temperature along the bottom here. That's what you read off a, a thermometer on the wall. Up the side here is the moisture content of the air. Um, so it's not lines here are the percentage saturation. So at 10 degrees centigrade, um, the air can carry that much water. It can't ca carry any more than that. At 30 degrees centigrade, it can carry that much less. And these lines here, these lines here are showing you the relative amounts. That's 100% saturated and this is just going to come down here. Now, um, the other important line is that one <coughs> there, which is the amount of energy in the air. Okay, so if you go from there to there, you are changing the energy, the amount of energy in the air. That's, that air has more energy than that air. Now, um, that's a fairly standard using environment conditioning, which is difficult to put in a mic. 20 degrees centigrade, 50 summer, it's got to cool the air down. You've got to take, cool it, reduce its temperature, and also take the water out of it. Now, the, the way in which, uh, the standard way of doing that is to cool the air down to its dew point, which is the point at which it, the air can't carry any more water. And then it goes dribble, 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 and condenses on the, um, within the, the equipment. And, um, Down that cove, uh, down here. Okay, so, so you're down at that point. Now, in in really extravagant systems, you actually reheat the air. So it's not only used all this electrical energy to to take that heat out, but then you add some more energy back in to to heat it up again. Um, that's the way you get really good control. Now. Um, you can see from this, and I'll just show you a piece of equipment that uh, will, it's a substitute. that's the sort of thing, you might have seen these sorts of things, but they're monstrous animals, but here we are, the air is sucked through here, it's cooled it, and it's heated and cooled, and then um, you've got some, um, that's where it's sitting inside, it's got these big fans blowing through the thing. Filter, so uh, <coughs> the first one's a little bit of scratching for the eyeball. Um, 
So the mechanistic solution uh, to keep uh, all the objects at the same temperature and the same um, um, uh, nice and constant is to um, circulate the air nice and fast around. Now, to minimize the amount of uh, energy, you can minimize the amount of air circulating around because these fans running full tilt use up a hell of a lot of energy. To, if you, the, the volume of air is simply determined by the number of people that you've got within the gallery. Now, if you're designing for a, um, a first night or something with um, three people per square meter, um, and in fact, you normally only lucky to get one or two people in the gallery at any one time. You've got this plant which is running full tilt um, uh, uh, and way over capacity. So one thing to do is to slow the stuff down. Um, then one should make the building airtight. So you're reducing the amount of infiltration and reducing the amount of this fresh air that you're dealing with. Um, use efficient lighting, which will have the, if you use incandescent light, it not only uses a lot of electri electricity to provide the lighting, but also it produces a lot of heat, which then has to be cooled by all this plant. Um, right, I'll better speed up now. The uh, a lower tech solution is not to use this equipment, but to um, use passive means by buffering spaces. Now, this is a case, it's not a very good, not a very nice case, but if what one's trying to do is not allow this point to swing around too much, well, if you put it in a case, it might seasonally drift up and down, but if you, if you seal it up, it will probably won't wander around too much. And if you put it within a building, which is also buffering swings in the air, then I think you've cracked it because all you want to do is to stop the swings uh, backwards and forwards. And as long as you've got a, a good enough buffer space, you've, um, you, you're, you're stopping the problems of um, this cyclical change. And that's the sort of the technique that, uh, that current galleries are, uh, um, well, newer thinking galleries are, are, are that's the, what they're adopting now. Uh, the final point I'll come on to is pollution. Um, so sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides uh, make sulfuric and nitric acid when they get into the art, which obviously rots it. The only way, of, the standard way of getting it out is by putting the air that you put into the, um, the gallery through carbon filters. And these are very expensive um, bits of equipment, which um, do work, but they're a bit of a black art because nobody knows, because you're trying to get the, uh, the SO2 and the, NO, uh, the NOx levels down so low, that um, you can't actually measure them. You measure them in the deterioration of the art rather than anything else, but by that it's a bit late. Uh, so w one finds, and certainly the big galleries have found that they've been ripped off in the, in the, um, in the carbon that they've got in their carbon filters. But um, there you are, that's real life view. Okay, um, I think I better hand on now. <laughs> okay, right. <laughs> okay, shall I uh, put on? This is, this is going to be very quick. I've got 10 minutes, I'm told, before Glenn Burkett, who will be much more interesting. Um, I'm going to talk mainly about lighting. I'm going to do it quite subjectively. I'm going to talk as a um, designing architect, making pragmatic and, I hope, practical decisions. Um, Anyway, to 
daylighting. Now, daylighting, and I, I work with Bill, and I think we have disagreements about one or two things, and I think daylighting might be one of them. I'm really interested in trying to use as much daylighting as much of the time. I'm willing to tolerate um, the, or shall I say, support the working non-artist not interested particularly in conservation, um, who is interested in what his work or her work looks like on the wall or in the space. Um, I'm, perhaps I should rather apologize for these somewhat twee examples, but they kind of illustrate what I'm trying to get at, which is just the effect that you get with natural lighting, with daylighting, that I cannot see that you ever can, can achieve artificially, no matter what your actual light source is, I can't see how you can get the subtlety that you can get, the way that, the, um, the way that those forms and shapes are, uh, uh, exist in light. I can't see that you can do that with artificial light. Um, it might be that it's to do with our perception, um, just um, the amount of tolerance that we have in our eyes, just the way that we unconsciously uh, look or perceive things. But um, if I move on to actual examples of uh, marks made on a texture on canvas with paint, uh, it's um, It's pretty difficult to um, to again to get that uh, to to um, allow the artist's marks to be seen to best advantage uh, in the way that the artist would want them to be seen. Uh, again, you know, my interest is in whenever possible, trying to use daylight um, to, to, to um, not to change the colors. They're generally speaking, the colors are chosen, selected, mixed, or in this case, straight from the tube, um, drawn straight out of the tube. Um, some just with the tube uh, squeezed and um, drawn across the canvas others with different brushes. Um, the, the actual texture, it seems to me, works brilliantly under daylighting. It's much deader, much flatter um, uh, when artificial lighting is, is used. Um, and, I mean, obviously we, we make decisions, but here, it's, it, it's trying to um, just allow allow the work to speak um, for itself, and so we are kind of performing this kind of neutral role, not not dressing it, not pointing lights at it, you know, not making those kind of decisions. And um, I suppose that the example that I Bill's first example, which, I, which sort of horrifies me, the the downlighter directly above the work, um, whichever way you look at it, it's what you see isn't what the artist, what the maker wanted you to see. It's what the lighting designer is interested in, or what the lighting manufacturer is interested in. Anyway, I, mean, I must be quick. Um, the space. Um, two examples uh, on the right, on the right hand side, um, the space without lighting, and the left with. Um, here, uh, it's the prototypical white gallery space. In fact, it is all white. Um, unusual to find the floor almost as white as the walls and the ceiling. Um, this is uh, Camden Arts Centre, a, a particular exhibition. Um, here, the artist was mostly interested in, in having his work floating in that space. The, the works were actually painted to fit those walls. And um, 
and, and, and painted in his studio, um, not under artificial light, under daylight. He was very familiar with what the, uh, what the surfaces, what the lines, what the marks on canvas were. They were designed to be seen uh, under daylighting, not under natural light. Um, and looking at the left-hand example, you, you immediately see uh, that, that the works are lit in a way that emphasizes, uh, that gives a particular emphasis to the bit of wall that the work is on. And, and you don't get quite that same evenness of wall and color and wall that you do with the naturally lit example. Um, it seems uh, that this raises other issues which perhaps we should talk about, like lighting track systems, um, which we, uh, we always find to be pretty nightmarish um, because firstly, they're never quite what one wants. Uh, secondly, curators usually hate them, hate them in the space, can't understand why we have to have them. And um, when John, if we, if we say, well, we don't, uh, you, know, you can't have flexible lighting and not have lighting tracks, I think it would be quite, it would be, in fact, a hell of a lot easier if we just had daylit galleries and we didn't have to worry about tracks and lighting altogether. Um, once you've got tracks, you've got to select fittings for them, and then there's a whole other disastrous story I almost always find with track manufacturers, uh, lighting system manufacturers, who seems to me aren't are much more worried about what their fittings look like than the quality of the light that they can give out. And um, the most, I mean, the most elegant ones tend to be the ones designed by Urco, who seem to make a whole range of fittings that look very similar, that take fluorescent, various sorts of fluorescents that are terrific as, uh, uh, until you actually turn them on, when you find out that each of the fluorescents has a slightly different color temperature, so you get slightly different colored lights coming out, uh, the, the light color changes slightly from fitting to fitting. And the, though you might get the right level of light on the wall, what you're putting on the work that you're trying to light is different colors, which is disastrous, hopeless. And uh, our artists hate it, and they're absolutely right. Curators hate it too. Uh, so if we could just work with daylighting, it would all be much, much simpler. Anyway, I, I'm going to quickly go through, we haven't got very much time, quickly go through so, some of the things I'm interested in that, that <coughs> should we say, modulate daylight and, and create different, um, different quality of light inside. Um, we, we probably all know where the left-hand example is. Uh, I think it works brilliantly um, in the sense that it, the space inside Stansted uh, Terminal has a sort of wonderful sort of milky quality of light, whether the sun's out or not and um, done with, you know, with, with, with quite a lot of subtlety and, and substantial amount of formal dexterity. And uh, in, at night, it also seems to be, work pretty well because this, the, the uh, transpa apparently transparent surface isn't, it's a mesh. And it, at night, it serves to reflect the up light back down again, sort of filling in what would otherwise be black holes. And, you, see, you don't quite get the milkiness you get during the day, but you get a pretty nice quality of light, nevertheless. Um, the next example, to my mind, is less successful. It's a gallery space, again, also by Foster's Bill McNeen. Um, and here, it's one of these systems of layers of louvers. In fact, I think above the glass, which you can just about, see, the roof light you can just about see through there, is another layer of louvers perhaps going the other way. I mean, it, 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 it's one way of uh, integrating the, the track lighting requirement. Um, sort of works. What I don't particularly like is, is the, the, the band of not uh, of solid around the perimeter of the room, which seems to me gives, gives the problem that um, all roof light spaces may have, which is that they're great about, uh, great to light middle of rooms, but 
what if you want to light the wall, which is kind of what we're supposed to be about. And, and then you rely on the reflectivity of the floor surface to, to uh, bounce light back onto the walls. Um, or, or you top it up with uh, artificial uh, light, uh, as in this example. Another of the areas where Phil and I have this kind of slight problem is that I think that it should be possible to, to make systems that can, can uh, modulate the light where you could have louvers or fins or whatever that can open and shut and that it seems to me surely it's possible now to write computer programs where you can and, and, and have devices that can move things around relatively uh, was, is possible in the way it wasn't possible 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, I think that this building, when it's working properly, what it does when clouds move across quickly across the sky and the way that it responds is, is absolutely wonderful. And it's wonderful when you're inside looking at all these things doing it, and it's pretty wonderful when you're outside looking at it. And I, I, I can't see why we can't manage to design electromechanical systems that do this. Our engineers seem to be too scared to do it. <laughs> Liability or something, I think somebody said. Anyway. Uh, other ways, other passive ways of, of, of keeping light, uh, of changing the light, keeping the, um, too much of it getting into the buildings. Um, I, you know, I give examples that I like because they're quite simple and they have a kind of mechanical uh, and form of beauty that's pretty attractive to me and the left one is just using different milky uh, milky toughened glass around a barrel does some wonderful things to the light that gets through it um, bounces it around between between the fins and then allows it through the glazed shell um, the uh, example on the right uh, uses perforated metal and you get this kind of butterfly green gossamer sort of effect again seems to be pretty successful in reducing the amount of light and yet having a kind of delicacy that's uh, seems to be appropriate to working with um, light. Um, project that we have at the moment which we have, we have worked through, I don't know, I think three different ways of dealing with this which is one big gallery space with one very big roof light. Um, it's far too bright sunny day. It's also far too hot most of the summer because there's no sun shielding whatsoever. Um, I think so far we've been through uh, louvers on the inside, blinds on the inside, blinds on the outside, blinds on the inside and louvers on the outside. And I think the current solution is tent over the top of the whole thing and avoiding all of those problems whatsoever. And I think that we've just about sold it to our own pretty sceptical client. Um, this, uh, it's, <laughs> as I should say, it's currently lit by 20 pound tungsten halogen fittings um, that the gallery director, well, the easiest, cheapest uh, way of lighting the space that the gallery director could find. And it is pretty unsatisfactory, but pretty pragmatic. Um, for the Gilbert and George exhibition that was there uh, a month or two ago, uh, in order to get the light levels down to stop the cibachrome work fading and to satisfy their insurance requirements, they put um, screens, they laid screens with light fabric over the uh, beams and reduced the light down to probably rather a lot more than 50 lux, which is what they claimed. Um, just quickly galloping through a couple of projects. One uh, this, is, this is not us keeping light out. Um, this is us not being artists, but uh, helping an artist do a project um, where the aim was, not, the aim was to make color. Um, here we mixed light in using red, green, and blue source to make uh, different colors, and the colors change according to changes in barometric pressure. Um, again, um, working with color, working with artists, um, 
here interest is in what color, what light coming through color, colored glass does uh, and how it's done. And one last project. Um, this was uh, my partner working with uh, Max Fordham 20 years ago, a small gallery in Stromness. Um, it, it has just about all of the problems you get with galleries. It's wet much of the time. It's cold in the winter. Um, in fact, it's too wet. Um, and it, uh, but anyway, a, a sophisticated system was designed to do all of the things that Bill pointed out on the, um, what are those charts called? Yeah. And, and, and it was, it, it worked wonderfully for, um, and here's a kind of object lesson, it worked wonderfully for about five years. And it was one of those super elegant systems that it had all been shoehorned into places under stairs and behind lavatories and so on and so on. And, and it was absolutely terrific until I think something like halfway through the second gallery director's term, um, something went slightly wrong with, with the plant and, and they, they never bothered to tell us. And it turned out that after, I think it was something like 10 years later, they did own up to the fact that, oh yes, it hadn't been working for a while, which we found out a while was about 10 years. And, um, and the interesting thing here is that uh, you know, we have all these requirement, conservation requirements to meet. And you know, we, we, we put enormous amounts of energy and sophisticated arguments and lies sometimes to conservation people about how we can do things. But, but it seems a sort of amazing thing is that none of this was ever, in this case at least, none of, none of this was ever followed up. And um, it seems that the Hepworth in the corner which is a piece, a timber piece. Um, it, it, uh, it's not supposed. It's supposed to be pretty kept in pretty secure and um, even condition, uh, but it just doesn't matter hugely to it. Uh, it, it the cracks in, in the wood get wider uh, or narrower depending on what the humidity is. Um, so far, remarkably, none of the work is showing any mold spots. And it's actually back, more or less, in the condition of the artist studios uh, who, um, who created it. Is that a single thing? <laughs> Good. Thank you.